Hello, welcome to this study for Sunday evening, April 19th, 2020. Uh, it's often been wondered, how does the law of Moses and the keeping of the Sabbath relate to Christians today? Well, when we read Exodus, we see that God is continuing his promises actually from Genesis. In Genesis 3 and verse 15, there was the promise of a seed that would redeem fallen man. Later in Genesis chapter 12, there were additional promises of a savior, one who would be a blessing to all the families of the earth. There was also a land and a nation promise. But thus far in the Bible account, God has carried on the seed through individuals. And now he is continuing the seed through the nation of Israel. And for this reason, he gives the people of Israel specific laws and instructions to keep them pure from the world around them and also to preserve his word. And among these laws, we see the Ten Commandments. Now, these Ten Commandments were a basis. They, they were not all the law, as we see in Leviticus. There are additional laws given. But these were those which built upon, were built upon for the laws that were to come. And in these laws, there's four. The first laws, the first four laws are in relation to man's relationship to God. And in the second six, or the last six, is man's relationship to man. Now, in speaking to the church in Rome, Paul said of these laws given to the Israelites, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would have not known sin except through the law. For I would have not known, or uh, for I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. This is recorded in Romans chapter 7 and verse 7. And Paul is referring to that law that was given to the Israelites at Mount Sinai, and so the law served a purpose, and it served the purpose to show what sin was. And we have to remember also that this law, it was given to the Israelites at Sinai. This was not for everyone. And so Paul says, though, that it did serve a purpose. It taught us what sin was. What did God find pleasing? Also, what did God find not pleasing? And it also, as we read the Old Testament, we understand how God dealt with man and additionally to how he felt about these things. Now, Paul says in Romans chapter 15 in verse 4, that whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and the comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. Now these things written, they were to teach us, as we said, God's dealings with man, but also how he taken and not only dealt with these things, but what he felt toward them. And we see that in his dealings, they were pointing to the time when the seed, the Redeemer, would come. Now, in writing to the church in Galatia, Paul says, therefore the law was a tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we're no longer under a tutor. In Galatians 3, verses 24 and 25. And John would tell us, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. In John 1, in verse 17. And so we see that the law did serve a purpose. It had a place and a time in which it was to be effective and to which it did its function. Well, when we look to Colossians 2, verses 14 through 17, we learn that Jesus has removed the law of Moses. It's having completed its purpose, making way for the new law that was in Christ. Look with me to Colossians chapter 2. When we look to Colossians chapter 2, and beginning in verse 14, we read, Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Well, this is obviously speaking of Jesus Christ. And these things that the law did, the law brought to us a remembrance of sin, it showed us what sin was. One of the things the old law never did was it never removed sin. It was a perpetual putting off of sin. Each year, the high priest would have to go in and make atonement for himself and then for the people. Later in Hebrews, we'll learn how Jesus is our atonement, that he died once for all. 
Well, continuing here in verse 15 of Colossians 2, it says, Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So let no one judge you in food or in drink regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Many of the things we read in the Old Testament, they were a shadow or an illusion. They were, they were an antitype of what was to come. Each one was setting an example, but with each one, while it had a truth and a place and a purpose in its time, it was really just an example of what was to come. One of the beautiful things about the book of Hebrews, about 13 times it talks about, the, it, it uses the word better. Now Christ was a better sacrifice for us. How we have better promises and how we are built upon those better promises. And so we see again, the law served its time. It, it was prophesied that, the, 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 that God would make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with Judah. When we think of Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 35. In fact, let's just turn there. In Jeremiah chapter 31, and we begin in verse 31, which makes it very easy to remember. One of the things I've always found interesting with the Bible is I often find, you know, man-made chapter divisions and verse numbers, but how often related verses seem to match as well. And how sometimes like this, 31, 31, easy to remember. Well, here we begin to read, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. He's noting that these two, Judah and Israel, and part of this is Christ is coming through Judah. Again, we look to the Hebrew writer. and He talks about how Christ was of the house of Judah. And this was never to be the priestly class. That was to be the Levites. But he also talks about how Christ as a priest is the order of Melchizedek, which is another lesson. But we see he was a priest and a king like Christ. And so Jesus, that he served on earth, he was not of the tribe of Levi. He could not have been a priest, and yet we see that he is our high priest because, again, going back to Hebrews, he is a better high priest, for he makes atonement once for all the people. Well, as we continue here, it says that this covenant that God is going to make with the house of Israel and with Judah, he says, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke Though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. He's speaking about that covenant that he made with the people in Exodus with Mount Sinai. He says, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. And so the law was not going to be written on stone tablets, but written upon the heart, which ties in also when we look to the New Testament of Jesus. It says, no more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin, I will remember no more. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for a light by day, the ordinance of the moon and the stars, but for a light by night, who disturbs the sea and its waves roar. And he goes on. If our, those ordinances depart from me. But notice what he says. No longer are we going to need to teach our neighbor. Now that's not to say that there's no teaching involved at all. When we read Matthew 28, 19 and 20, we see the Great Commission. There is a teaching that leads us to the faith to be obedient, to be baptized into Christ. And there is an additional teaching, once again, to we grow in the faith and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus and Christ. But in the Old Testament, when we look to the nation of Israel, they were born into the nation of Israel. They were born Hebrews or Jews. And they then had to be taught the law. But when we look to the New Testament, to this new covenant, Matthew 26 and verses 26 through 28, uh, we see Jesus initiating the Lord's Supper. And he says that his blood not only is for the redemption or the forgiveness of sins, but it is the blood for the new covenant. The Hebrew writer also showing that covenants were issued in with the shedding of blood. Well, when we look to this, we see that, you know, not that there is no teaching at all, but 
We're not born by natural birth into being a Christian. And Paul, uh, John, or in John chapter 3, Jesus talks with Nicodemus about that new birth. Well, we see here, no more shall they teach his neighbor, is not, again, saying there's no teaching. But rather than being born a Jew, we're not born a Christian in the natural sense. And so while those uh, children in the Israelite nation would need to be taught the law of Moses so they could grow up into it and to obey it, we see that we, through our teaching of, the, of Christ, that it, uh, the faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, verse 17, we then make the choice of that new birth and to be born into Christ, and therefore being disciples or Christians. And so not our, we are not needed to be taught in that sense at our birth because there is the teaching that led us to that new birth. We weren't just born a Christian as a natural birth. It was a spiritual birth, a new birth. Now, after that, yes, there is teaching that needs to take place to take and lead us into the full grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, to bring us to all the things needed to know for salvation, the way we are to live our lives as Christians, to ensure that we are remaining faithful until the end, and we'll be granted that crown of life. But we take and we accept Christ, and then we are born into Christ through that baptism, having already known. So we don't have to be taught in that, you know, in the sense that, well, we just suddenly were a Christian, and now you need to know what it means to be a Christian. Well, yes, there is a teaching that leads us to baptism. And yes, there is a teaching that leads us into full faith or full growth and maturity in Christ. But it's not the same as they had in the Old Testament when we look to that nation of Israel. Well, again, no one was ever saved under the law of Moses. And, and for the simple reason, no one could keep it perfectly. And the exception, of course, being Jesus Christ. And he then has uh, taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, Colossians 2 verse 14 says. None were justified by the law because all sinned. We read that in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For all sin and fall short of the glory of God. And so none can be justified through themselves. We can't be accounted righteous in our own acts or deeds. When we look to the law because all sin, but we are accounted to righteousness looking to the time when Christ would come. We think of Abraham. Abraham was accounted righteous. Why? Because he was obedient. He had obedient faith, what God has always called for us to have. We see that this obedient faith, that's a faith that leads us to a trust in God, who then will be, be obedient to his word. And by being obedient to his word, then we do the things which he has said. Jesus even saying, if you love me, keep my commandments. In John 14, verse 15. And having kept those commandments, we see that there is that new birth, we are made righteous in Christ, but there is a continuing that we need to remain faithful. Well, since the law of Moses condemned by making sin known, it could not save, and therefore it was contrary to us. There was no salvation in keeping the law. It was always a looking forward, a removal of sin only for a time. Well, Jesus removed those old laws upon his death on the cross which also removed the obstacle of forgiveness. That was not in the old law. However, the moral laws, not the ceremonial laws, were reinstated in the new covenant, and they are to be obeyed. Not because they were given to the nation of Israel under the old law at Mount Sinai, but because they are part of the new law that is in Christ. One of the things we read in James, he talks about the law of liberty, or the spirit of the law. And there is a law that we have today that is a law of Christ. We're not without law at all, but we are not under that old law that was given to the Israelites at Mount Sinai. Well, Colossians 2 verse 15 is a figure of speech of the treatment of enemies when conquered. Jesus was condemned by the Jewish leaders and the Roman government. But also Satan thought that he had conquered Christ. But it was Christ who was triumphant. He overcame death. And in his resurrection, he was openly and visibly triumphant over all his enemies. 
And he's also was given the keys of Hades and of death. You see, he holds the keys to the door. You see, redemption and forgiveness are only through him. In fact, when we look to Acts, it says that there is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved, and that being Jesus Christ. Well, because the old covenant had been taken out of the way, nailed to the cross, Paul says the things in the old covenant are no longer binding, and therefore we're not to be judged regarding no longer observing them. Food or drink refers to the ceremonial as well as the regulations under the old law of clean and unclean things. There are many things that we saw that Jews were not allowed to eat. They weren't allowed to do certain things, wear certain clothing. Those are no longer binding upon us today. In fact, Jesus would speak that it's not what goes into a man that makes him unclean, but what comes out of him. And what are we really filling our minds with? What are we filling our hearts with? James talks about sin in James chapter 1, beginning in verse 13, that it comes from our desires. Well, is our desire to do evil? Is our desire to follow the ways of the world? Or, as Colossians talks about, are we setting our mind on things above? Well, the old law, we see festivals and new moons as referring to those elements of the old law, as well as the traditions that had been handed down. As Christians, we're not bound by these in our uh, in our worship or our service to God. Now, our rest is in Christ. And in the first day of the week, recognizes the rest that we have in Christ, the new life and the liberty. It's not a physical rest that is now sought, but the life and the immortality that has been brought to light in Christ. On Sunday, the first day of the week, the believer takes time from his labors so that he may honor Christ by his spiritual service. However, this is not a Sabbath. It's not that old law Sabbath given to the Jews and include, because it's included in those things that were abolished. Now, some people asked when the Sabbath would end in Amos chapter 8 and verse 5. And the prophet's answer was, And it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord God, that I will make the sun go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in broad daylight. Amos 8 and verse 9. And the sun was darkened when Christ was crucified. And the Sabbath was nailed to the cross. Luke 23, verses 44 through 45. We see the veil of the temple was torn in two. No longer was that binding. God was no longer making his dwelling place in a house built by man. In fact, Jesus would even talk about that in John chapter 4. When the Samaritan woman asked, you know, the Jews say, you know, to worship in Jerusalem and, you know, our fathers say on the mountain. And Jesus said the day is coming when you'll neither worship in Jerusalem or on the mountain, but that God is spirit and he, uh, that those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So how does the law, the Ten Commandments that we read of in Exodus 20, 1 through 17, relate to us today? Well, all but one is continued in what we referred to earlier, the law of Christ or the spirit of the law, the law of liberty. And we see that all of the commandments that we read of in the Ten Commandments are found in the New Testament given by Jesus and his apostles, with the exception of to obey the Sabbath or keep the Sabbath. That one command is not included. Christians follow Christ. And the day of worship has been moved to the first day of the week. It's been done because of the recognition of his resurrection on the first day of the week, his subsequent appearances on the first day of the week, the preaching of the gospel on the first day of the week, on the day of Pentecost. We see all those things that Jesus has moved. He has taken those things that were shadows of what was before. He's changed them into the new law of Christ. No longer do we take and keep the old law but not to say that it's not without its benefits. As Paul showed us, they were there for our learning. It was for our admonition. It was so that we could look to the past. We could understand what God had for man, what he desired, what he was displeased with, how he dealt with man, how he desired man to deal with one another and to deal with him, the relationship to him. Well, today, we keep the laws given to us, which originated with God. They're given through the prophet, the one greater than Moses. Moses said that there was going to come one, one among your brethren, who God will raise up, and he'll be greater than I. It is him you should listen to.
And we look to Jesus, even John the Baptist. He said there was one greater than he coming. He was only making way for the coming of the Lord and the kingdom. And even when Jesus was baptized by John, we hear that voice from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. It was repeated again for Peter and John on the Mount of Transfiguration. Hear him. So today, yes, that Old Testament law, it had its purpose. It served its purpose. It's no longer binding upon us. But we look to the perfect law, the law of liberty, that which we have looked for from day one when man first sinned in the garden, that promise of a redeemer. And that redeemer has come in the form of Jesus Christ. And he has given us his word to follow. And we need to follow his word. This is God's beloved Son. Hear Him. God loves you, and so do I. If you need to respond to the gospel, if, if you've heard of the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and you've come to believe that, well, the Lord has called us to do certain things upon our hearing and belief. He's called us to repent, to turn away from sin, and to turn to Him. It, it's more than just a not do, looking to do evil, but to actually do what God has called us to do. This is called repentance. He also calls for us to confess our faith. This is not a confession where we go to somebody and we tell them all of our sins. This is like the Ethiopian or like Peter who said, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. That belief mean, moving us to obedience. If we truly believe that he is the Christ, that eternal life is in him, and he has given us commands, then we will obey them. And he calls us to be baptized, to be buried in water. It is there that he unites us with himself. He unites us with other Christians. He washes away our sins and he adds us to his church. And then he calls for us to lead a life of faithfulness. And in the end, he has also offered us an eternal home in heaven. Now, we don't do these things and remain faithful because of the promise of some reward. We have no salvation in ourselves. Rather, we do these because of our love for God, because of his love for us. He has shown us love and mercy, and we reciprocate that. And in the end, there is a home, an eternal home. If you'd like to learn more, feel free to contact us. Remember, God loves you, and so do I.